Hello again. I'm uh, I'm Roy Sturman from Lightbeats Labs, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk today about NVMe over TCP. I'm going to speak in general about NVMe over fabrics and what we've done in the last few years in the community. And then I'm going to present the, the new cool protocol, uh, which is over TCP IP. We'll talk a little bit about the future work that we see that we need to implement as part of the protocol. And uh, we will discuss the performance comparison between NVMe or TCP versus different storage protocols that seems to be the competitors of NVMe or TCP. So a few years ago, we got those new NVMe controllers, which let us the, the opportunity to, to run application intensive I.O. application locally on a direct attached storage device with high, very high performance versus the, versus the other storage devices that we were familiar with. But the problem, the problem was that those devices were installed locally. They couldn't be shared between different clients. And in that point, we got NVMe over fabrics into the picture. So we, we understood that we need to share those devices over the network, the same way that iSCSI, for example, is doing for SCSI. So in early 2014, uh, we initialized the pre-standard of NVMe over RDMA. RDMA is Remote Direct Memory Access, I believe most of you are familiar with. And <clears throat> It basically was the first over the fabric standard that include NVMe inside of it. So you can use NVMe just from remote host. Later on, uh, we got the standardization of NVMe OF 1.0, which was released by NVMe.org. And later on in 2015, NVMe.org basically formed a group of key developers in the Linux community that will develop together both the local stack, the NVMe PCI stack, together on the same Git repository with the NVMe over fabric stack. So they converge, we converge basically uh, to a common starting point on the same repository. And we, we did some heavy lifting of both stacks, the local NVMe stack and the over the fabric stack, which was pretty new. Later on in 2016, uh, NVMe over fabric support was merged into the Linux kernel. I think, yeah, it was kernel uh, 4.8. And people started to use it and to deploy it. And we started to see uh, people are opening bugs at the community. And it was first, it left the, the nice and cozy place where only the developers were, one, were the one that were using it and move to a place that everyone can use it and everyone's are starting to install it. Okay. Yeah. So what we had since, we, we did multiple uh, stability fixes, okay? NVMe over Fabrics was a new driver that was using uh, mainly kernel generic APIs, but it has uh, its own uh, caveats where we, we discover later. We added uh, instrumentation because giving someone a driver to use without the proper tools to debug it is, is very hard, you know, if you want him to deploy it. Uh, we enhanced the tool chain to give, so th there is like for NVMe, there is the CLI, which is the NVMe CLI. Uh, which gives you many options to, to um, configure your controller uh, with attributes that you are willing to use, like we, we'll talk about it later. We also uh, added UUID support in case someone wants consistency over the fabric. Let's say I want to keep the same block device uh, below the file system over and over again. So we added the UUID support into the target side of the fabric's driver. A few more enhancements are the Opal support, uh, which is basically used today in the NVMe PCI layer. Uh, the IO polling support, which is uh, opportunistic polling, 
in the block layer, and the ANA, which is the asynchronic namespace support. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but just in few words, ANA gives you the option to have a fast path and slow path to the same namespace. Uh, so in case of uh, network disruption, you can get through the slow path and just make it the, the fast path if you want. <coughs> After uh, NVMe over the fabric standardization, basically, we got the 1.1 version, the 1.1 standard, where we initially saw the, the new protocol, which is NVMe over TCP. Pretty exciting moment for us after a few years of writing the code and debugging and trying to push it further into the standardization part. We saw also a few other things that we'll discuss. Uh, one of them is the dynamic resource enumeration. So dynamic resource enumeration gives you the opportunity to have a stronger ecosystem by building a discovery, a discovery service that can discover new subsystem in your, uh, in your cluster without, any, without doing anything uh, else, basically. And the other thing is SQ uh, submission queue flow control disabled mode. So submission queue flow control disabled mode is actually because in the original spec of NVMe, uh, there is some field in the completion queue entry that says that the controller needs to put the submission queue entry head, like where the, the submission queue, where the controller is processing in the submission queue currently. Over the fabric, it doesn't have any meaning, so in this standard, we basically g gave the host the option not to use this field, because till then it was just nothing. And the last one is traffic-based keep alive. So we, we saw multiple tests uh, in TCP and RDMA that during high congestion over the network, the keep alive message that should say that the connection is still alive, uh, where it was delayed too much and it caused the connection to, to go into error flow, which caused many disruption in the session itself. So we changed it in the standard and in the code itself. So in case there is any traffic between the host and the controller, you don't need to send any keep alive because there, there is traffic. So the connection is, is alive, basically. And it's important to understand that all those suggestions and all the, the, the code that were, was developed uh, by the community was both developed and deployed by the same people. So it was very nice and easy to get things going. So why NVMe over TCP? First of all, it's easy to use. You know, it's run, it runs over anything. When people ask me usually, OK, I want to deploy NVMe over TCP. I got the code. I, I cloned the, the Linux upstream. And all. What, what do I need to do? I tell them, you, you need ping. OK, if ping is working between the client and the server, you can deploy NVMe over TCP without any issues. It's well understood. TCP is probably the most common transport. High performance. TCP is scalable. It delivers excellent performance. It's well suited for large scale deployments and long, longer distances. So actually, a few weeks ago, we did an experiment. We, we used NVMe over TCP. Like, I think it was, I don't know, but a few dozen of kilometers. Like, so it, it was a long distance in terms of data centers. It's evolving. Uh, it's maintained and enhanced. And TCP in the kernel is developed by key developers and major players. So we don't need actually to maintain NVMe or TCP, the transport layer inside the protocol, because there is a strong community of TCP IP in the kernel itself. And inherently, it supports in-transit encryption, which we'll talk about in a few slides. So here, I'm going to present uh, from the host perspective and from the target perspective the changes that we have done inside the drivers. When we started to develop NVMe over TCP, we didn't want it to be like a, an extension to the driver. We just wanted to be another transport binding that will just make it as another tra transport that is using most of the common code of NVMe over fabrics. So as you can see here, um, 
It goes from user space through VFS, through the block multi-queue layer, and then it goes and basically defines the transport. So you have there a NVMe fiber channel on the right side. Uh, just next to it, you have NVMe or TCP, NVMe RDMA, and the one that is a little bit different because it goes through PCI and not through Ethernet or some fiber channel is the NVMe PCI stack. So we just added it as another transport binding without any unnecessary changes. Control plane, very similar to RDMA, and <coughs> error flow is also very similar, but we still have plenty of room, and actually these days we're working about few extra changes that will make it even more generic and agnostic to other transport. On the target side, we try to do the same thing, basically. We we put the NVMe uh, over TCP again, just as a transport binding, very few changes to the existing core and fabric stack. And as you can see here, this is actually a few weeks ago. This is not from yesterday, because yesterday I checked it and it's different. But as you can see here, most of the code sits in the common driver. We Today, we are almost reaching the 45% of the code in the common driver, but we are still working on it, and still there is plenty of room for improvements. OK, so let's discuss a little bit about the, the advantages of NVMe or TCP versus different uh, storage protocols over, there, over the network. So NVMe or TCP uh, actually map, is mapping each and every NVMe queue to TCP connection. So basically, if you have, let's say, many CPUs, many cores on the host side, and you want to run many IOPS, you can, you can open multiple TCP connections, which will be mapped to multiple NVMe queues, which will act as separate queues, like as said in the slide. There is no controller wide sequ sequencing. OK, you don't need to wait for packets to arrive to a different queue to send a message on this queue. They're working in true parallelism. So there is also no controller-wide reassembly constraints, if you're familiar with other uh, storage protocols, <coughs> which basically gives the high performance that we will see in a few slides with NVMe or TCP. By the way, the connection binding uh, is performed during the connect phase of NVMe over fabrics in general, nothing special for TCP here. This is the protocol data unit, if we are going a little bit deeper into the protocol itself. Uh, every NVMe over TCP message is encapsulated inside uh, this PDU, basically. Um, <clears throat> this is the only overhead that we have with NVMe over TCP if we are excluding stuff like uh, TLS and other cool stuff that you can use with NVMe over TCP. So the capsules and data are encapsulated inside the PDU and uh, it has few structures inside of it. There is the header on the top, as you can see, which is in with includes the common header, which every PDU had, and PDU-specific header. We'll talk about it in the next slide. The header has header digest, if you want to use digest over the network, and VMware or TCP supports it. We have the PDU padding, in case you're working with some hardware acceleration. We, we wanted to make the spec works with also hardware acceleration, in case they're, they need alignment of, I don't know, like 64 bytes or something. After the padding, we have the data itself. And after the data, we have the data digest, if you want to enable it. Data digest and header digest work together. You can't enable only one of them. You need to work with both or none. So what are the PDU types that we will use in NVMe or TCP? First one are the initialized connection PDUs. Each and every PDU, it's, it's unidirectional, which means that every PDU has a direction. It can be from host to controller or from controller to host. Now, for those of you who are more familiar with protocols like iSCSI, for example, where we have the initiator and the target terminology, 
In NVMe and NVMe over fabrics, the client side call host and the target side is called the controller. So where, where it says host to controller, it basically means client to target. So we have the connect PDUs, which basically initiating the connection. We have the terminate PDUs. Terminate PDUs are only used for error flow in case there is internal transport error inside the protocol itself. And the target want to say the initiator, oh, okay, I'm going to shut down the connection. So feel free to do whatever you want before, but I'm going to shut down the connection because I identified some kind of error. And <clears throat> capsule command and capsule response are basically the commands and the completions that, are, that the host and the controller are sending over the wire. And host to controller data and controller to host data are basically the, the actual data, the thing that we want to get over the wire and to process in the storage or in the compute. Now, the, the last one is the interesting one because it basically uh, gives you the opportunity to, to control a protocol like NVMe or TCP over the wire without getting uh, out of memory and stuff like this. So it's ready to transfer. <coughs> it's a PDU that is only sent from the target side. Unlike uh, other protocols like RDMA, for example, when the target and the client knows for sure that the other side has a buffer, for the, for the upcoming data. In TCP, you can't, you can't be sure that the other side has a free space of memory to get this data. So basically, ready to transfer uh, is used for the target side, for the controller side, to say to the host side, OK, you can send data. We'll see it in a minute. So here are IO flows uh, for NVMe read and NVMe write. As you can see, the read is more simpler. It has only the command capsule PDU. And then we see the data, the data from the controller to the host. And after the controller finished to send the, the data, uh, it sent the completion inside the response capsule. On the right side, you can see it is much more interesting because during the I.O., you can see the ready to, to transmit, uh, ready to transfer uh, packets. And you can see that the host will not send data until it will get the ready to transfer. Now, inside the ready to transfer, it says how many bytes the host can send. So as you can see, there are two packets. There are two PDUs of ready to transfer. Because probably the first one was, I don't know, only for 2K. And the host wanted to send 4K, so he needed to wait until it, it will send another ready to transfer. Also today, the spec is defining parallel uh, multiple ready to transfer, but it's not yet implemented. We are currently working on it. OK, so the NVMe TCP Linux support uh, actually started in 2017 after a few different branches and Git repositories. A few different vendors provide NVMe over TCP solution, Lightbeat, Sulfur, Chelsea, and others. Uh, we converged on a single code base, again, the same as we did with the NVMe over Fabrics code. And code currently is in solid shape, and you can actually find it in kernel uh, 5.0, the NVMe over TCP. So it's nice and exciting for all of us, I guess. When we designed the, when we basically implemented the driver and added the design for the client side, there were a few uh, bullets that we tried to keep, and uh, I hope we did, but we are still working on it. So we have a single reactor thread per CPU. We are not sharing any resources between different CPUs on the NVMe over TCP host side, and we we basically did it to try and keep uh, context switches to the absolute minimum. We are still seeing some, some spikes of latency because of context switches in the driver that we are currently working on these days. And, but we also wanted to spread all the NVMe queues among different reactors, also to have one uh, context and one NVMe queue per CPU on the client side, on the hot side. We never block on IO, unlike other TCP implementation, uh, for those of you who are familiar with. Uh, we aggressively avoid data copy. So currently, we are copying in uh, RxPath. Um, we have plans to change that as well. But today, TxPath is zero copy uh, without any, any copy. And we'll see we had some issues with that. But Rx is still single copy, and we would like to change it. 
Uh, we reuse common kernel interfaces, uh, BioVec, IOV Eater, Socket Datogram Operation. We didn't add any other layer of transport inside our protocol. We wanted to use as much as possible the, the existing stuff from the kernel and just use it wisely. Uh, <clears throat> so Rx is either handled in soft IRQ or in the same reactor context. Here we discovered that there are few network devices that from the network device, if you're handling the data processing, and data processing in this case is copying the data, as we said, from the IRQ context, you can get multiple out of order packets which can be crucial in protocols like TCP. You want to avoid out of order packets as much as possible and we, we discovered that there are a few cases that you don't want to process data from the IRQ context and you want to do it from the reactor context. We keep atomic operations to an absolute minimum and keep it uncontended. So we have few locks in the, in the driver but most of them are uncontended and probably necessary. <clears throat> and we have also fairness and budgeting in, in the reactor itself, so there will, no, there will not be any starvation from one NVMe queue to the others on the same reactor, be because we want to serve all NVMe queues and we don't want to starve any of those. So now, now I'll present like, I think two or three issues that we discovered during the development of NVMe or TCP and we contributed back to the kernel. The first, uh, the first problem that we saw that it was, we, we had like performance degradation when working with data digest with the interfaces the kernel is providing. And we were using a SKB copy datagram eater for incoming data placement and all, all the abstraction was there. The only problem is that when you're doing a data digest, you have two options. You can do data digest on each and every SKB that you're processing on, on runtime basically, but you, you didn't have any kernel interface to do it. Or you can get the whole uh, frame basically, the whole NVMe or TCP message and do data digest on that. So we discovered that when you're waiting for the whole data to come, the whole message to arrive before digesting it, uh, the data is not hot in the cache and it causes performance degradation. So we provided a new interface and we contributed it back to the kernel, which called SKB copy and hash datagram eater, which receive a pre-initialized struct. So, so all the digest will happen uh, online, basically, and all the data will be hot in the cache when you want to digest it. The, the other uh, problem that we discovered, actually it happened during uh, one of our uh, continuous integration runs. Um, NVMe TCP PDUs are like any other da data, uh, zero copied on the way out. Okay, we are not copying the PDUs also on the TX, although they are not big, but we didn't want to copy any, any type of data in the protocol. And when the queue depth was high and the network was very congested, we got into a situation where with specific kernel hardening, we got this uh, beautiful uh, crash log that you see on the right. We started to investigate it. As you can see, the, the, the process that caused this crash is DH client, and we, we actually couldn't understand how it happened. <coughs> but eventually we understand that the kernel will panic uh, when user copy attempts to read slab originated buffer if they cross slab object. So the PDU headers were allocated using the slab. We didn't use the, the original page uh, allocation, uh, which caused the DH client just to, to take some packets and to try and parse it. But those packets were from two different slab objects. And the heuristic here says that it can be attempt to catch uh, and exploit the data. So, as, as mentioned, user, user space programs is allowed to use packet filters and read, BPF, TAP, and DH client. Basically, every user space program can panic the kernel, which is not the behavior that we wanted to have. And uh, we solved it by page fragments API. So we moved each and every uh, PDU basically to 
Okay, so we used PageFrag cache, which is an interface of the kernel, and we got two optimizations from that. The first one, we are not getting the kernel crash because of that. The second one, we are much more, uh, we are avoiding CPU calls sharing atomic areas because two CPUs can use the same slab object, which basically means that two, two CPUs are taking ref count on this object, which is causing performance degradation eventually. So as mentioned, uh, um, the current features today in the kernel is zero copy transmission. Uh, we are not copying on the TX. Uh, we do online integrity with header data digest, and we have uh, CPU NUMA affinity assignment for IOTRAD. And future work will be TLS support. We want to add encryption support. We have it in the standard. Polling mode IO currently is not implemented and out of order data transfers from the co uh, controller to the host. So I'll go quick about the TLS. TLS currently is not implemented in the kernel. Uh, currently we are working on porting the TLS handshake from the user space to the kernel. Uh, we, we saw some issues with implementing it uh, by uh, trampling the, the, the handshake to user space like other protocols. But we're currently working on it. But it is in the standard. So basically, NVMe over TCP is, is, can be the first consumer of TLS handshake inside the kernel. And I will just go quick about the performance. So we have three protocols that we are comparing. The first one is NVMe over TCP. The other is NVMe over RDMA. And the third is iSCSI. As you can see here, NVMe over TCP is much more comparable with NVMe over RDMA than with iSCSI. So this is the QD1 uh, canonical latency. This is the throughput comparison, NVMe TCP versus iSCSI, where you can see NVMe TCP is much more scalable, and iSCSI is basically uh, doesn't go over the, I'm not sure how much is it. I think it's 2.5 gigabytes. And the same experiment, just with 4K IOPS, that you can see the NVMe over TCP is going high and high. OK, that, that was all. Um, any questions? Yeah. One, one question, no time. Hi. So uh, what we saw with the NVMe over TCP implementation is uh, most of the time the submission and the completion does not happen in the software. It is happening in the worker thread. And that is one of the reasons of the high context switches. So. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, but you, you saw that the submission and completion are not coming from the, the reactor itself? No. Our trace does not show. OK, so uh, actually, the, the, the only thing that we witnessed with stuff that, uh, that are related to the completion and submission is that sometimes, inherently, from the TCP IP stack, when you're working with single reactor, uh, you can see that the reactor is not processing anything because it it holds on the socket lock. So I'm not sure if th that's the case, but with many reactors, we didn't saw any processing issues. And most of the time, we, we measure the context switches, and we see that the application and the driver itself are getting almost the same uh, slice of, of cycles from the CPU. OK. OK. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.